So Sebastian Stroll is my name. I work as a principal engineer. That means that uh, I'm not very good at buzzwords, but that means that I get to focus every now and then on, on things. And so today, since we have 20 minutes, I'll try to make this focused and, and talk about one thing. It, it's going to, um, it really touches upon everything we've heard about so far and that we're talking about in this con uh, uh, during this conference on how, how, how can we automate, how can we get that agility that we want, want to get to. Uh, but what I want to do now is talk about, uh, I'm going to propose that we follow some standards. Uh, I'm not going to make it boring, I hope, but <laughs> it's, it's going to be a little bit technical, but at a level that I think that you will follow me along. And I want for you uh, in here that are in charge of building VN apps, I want you to try to follow my, my standard. And uh, for those of you that are actually buying these things, I want you to start demanding standards. So uh, I currently work most, mostly with orchestrating uh, both physical and virtual hardware. But my background is, is TLF, so I've been working with, at TLF for um, 10 years. And that's, that's where I started also from the uh, kind of network element side and building myself upwards. All right, so let's, let me see here. Ooh, all right. So let's see if we can uh, get into what I want to talk about. So uh, when we talk about management about VNFs, I mean, it's, it's pretty much, uh, there's a lot of talk going on. How are we going to uh, get these VNFs booted, placed in the right place, connected to the right physical network, connected to the right virtual network, making sure that it has the right resources, and, and God forbid, also enable it, uh, the, its licenses. And, and how do we actually get to what's usually referred to uh, just the, uh, the day zero config, or just the day, even the day minus one, and, and the onboarding aspects. And, we have to make that a lot easier because it sure isn't today. I mean, this, this is really, we're wrestling of just deploying these networks that, I mean, should be sort of straightforward. Uh, but that's not what I was talking about today. I think something that we forget is that once we actually do get past this, and please keep working on that because, as I said, it's, it, it definitely needs some work. But once we have our VNFs up, what are we going to do about management? What are we going to do about day two? How are we going to keep sort of uh, changing these? So if we, if, I mean, I, I, I figure I have to throw in an architecture picture in here as well to just to point out where I'm talking, uh, what I'm talking about. Uh, I want to talk about where, once we have these VNFs up and running, how do we actually configure them? Um, because I think that's, that's really something that we're, we're struggling with today. And I think what most of us are doing is really just we're taking these old uh, network operating systems that we have, and, and I'll include my, my own company here as well, and we're booting them up in a virtual machine, and then we think we're done. We pretty much uh, 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 we provide the, 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 the same old, same old uh, interfaces. What are the challenges to, to, to this? And I think, I mean, we've heard everybody talking about this now. Now that we, that becomes virtual, uh, we, we have a completely different scale of management. Physical devices, I mean, at least, I mean, you, they're easy, uh, not always, but they're countable. <laughs> when it comes to virtual, it becomes a completely different game. So, I mean, just take, for example, uh, partner VPN networks. Uh, typically, uh, the economics of a physical uh, partnering VPN, I mean, what you will do, you will, have, you will buy a firewall and maybe you'll buy VPN termination from the same vendor, you'll install this, and you'll have your department taking care of it. And the economics of the physical part is that you want to utilize it as much as possible. I mean, this is nothing, I mean, new, you, you all know this. Uh, and so that means that for every new partner you want to add a VPN to, you'll have your, your IT department uh, manually going in and, and uh, configure this the, the, and add it to this firewall. You introduce the sort of risk of, of, uh, of, of interfering with the current services that you're actually running for your other partners. And so in the virtual case, I mean, what you would rather like to do is, well, you know, the economics isn't that I have to run everything on the same firewall. Why don't I just spin up another pair of firewalls and, and other VPNs? So, but that means now you're going to need to manage 
one firewall for each of these connections. So management becomes more complex. More, uh, more now virtual boxes, but means more management. So, uh, and again, I mean, as, as we, we heard here, uh, this is also going to make uh, multi-vendor more prevalent, I think. I mean, we're, we're going to see that uh, once you can easily swap out a vendor, you will choose the best of breed. I mean, why would uh, it's, once you bought a hardware, it's expensive to swap it out. But uh, swapping out a, a virtual machine, that's not as expensive. You just take the, the vendor that actually does what you want it to do and is the best in, in its class, and you'll swap that out. So again, more multi-vendor, more, um, more actual nodes to manage. So that's, that's going to drive uh, automation. We, we really, really need automation. And to do uh, automation, how can we do that? All right, so what I said before was that we typically just bring up our old, uh, uh, old network operating systems and we say, hey, look, we have a virtual firewall. But they don't really provide any programmable interface. They'll have your CLI, they'll have uh, uh, perhaps your old SNMP, and maybe you, you have training in, in your staff to actually uh, configure this CLI because it's the same vendor that you bought the physical box before. Uh, but, and maybe you even have some ways of automation. Maybe you have some scripts that you can reuse. But the promise was that you were supposed to be able to swap vendors easily. But your training is all about on that old, old type management interface. So how, how to get, get, uh, get around that? There are, I mean, if, if uh, some are trying to uh, provide some kind of programmable interfaces, and I think sort of the latest trend in that is really uh, providing a REST interface. I'd say that's about as bad as the CLI, but with sort of an HTTP twist to it, so that it at least has some kind of regular syntax. I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about that uh, further on. All right, so what are all these cool promises that we want from pro programmability? Well, it is the key to automation. I mean, we need to start thinking about uh, uh, solving the problems that, that I mentioned before. Uh, we want to be able to apply all these cool DevOps processes and sort of be agile and try to, to uh, develop processes where we can deploy new services by actually testing them and deploying them in a, in a controlled manner. And for that, I think that uh, we need uh, programmability. And programmability is really also what will enable new innovation here. I mean, I think the, uh, the, the ability to combine these VNFs into new service chains into ways that we as, as vendors, we can't really imagine how the, a new service change will look like. It'll probably be multi-vendor chains that will probably happen in, in, uh, at Centrelink, at level three, at these, uh, even the service providers themselves will be able to combine uh, our VNFs in new ways that we haven't thought about. But the key to that is really that they can actually do some programming there. So what, what does that mean? Well, I mean, the, this is what everybody's talking about in, 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 in software-defined networking. It really is uh, having, being able to take the network elements and think of them as something that you can program, not just something that you actually imperatively have to poke to perform a particular function. You want to be able to start thinking about uh, the, the, these, these elements as, as having uh, an interface instead. And this, this is really... I mean, something that I think we've heard over and over. And it's really, uh, that's, com I want to say the word, so I'm going to skip to the next slide. <laughs> it's really the, the, the API, the application programming interface. I mean, that's where we want to be. We want our, our elements to have uh, an API, and that will, uh, is, <laughs> and I was skipping that because it's sort of what everybody's saying all day, and you hear it from, from all the, the, the I mean, it's, it's not something uh, new. You've heard it the last couple of years from, from, from the Googles, from the Amazon, from the Netflix. I mean, this is what they're talking about, having something that they can program towards. And there are a couple of, of uh, specific properties that we really want, want from an API. We want to be able to, to, to sort of talk about what data is available. I mean, what kind of attributes does this element have? How is it organized? Is there a structure to it? Uh, and how do I access it? How do I read? How do I manipulate the, the, the data that's available? I want to be able to start thinking about these not as sort of 
physical network elements or even virtual little nodes, I want to be thinking of them as something that I can write a, a program towards. And I've gone this far without actually saying where I want to go. Well, I'm going to reveal it right now. I'm going to propose <laughs> that we use a standard that's already that's, uh, well and mature now. It's prevalent already in the industry. And it's uh, using Yang for a data model and NetConf as a protocol. And I'm going to argue that what they do together is provide that API. Yang gives you a description of what your element actually has and what it can do, how it's structured uh, information, and NetConf gives you the methods to actually access it and to manipulate it. It, it really, and, and I mean, I, I, I couldn't, oh, I'm gonna go back. Um, I, I find, I mean, the, the whole purpose of, uh, of, of Yang is really to have a specification. I mean, it, it, in one sense, it's the, ASN1 slash MIB for, for, uh, for, 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 for the modern world, for configuration. It's, but it, it was designed from the ground up to be readable by humans, to be writable by humans, and, but at the same time be parsable by machines. Mm -hmm. So it, it really is something that, that you, once you actually do have a, 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 a Yang model with a NetConf interface to it, you will have an API towards these devices. And so what, so what is the difference then between uh, the problems that we have with the CLI? I think CLI has two issues. One is, is obvious. I mean, it, it, it's not regular, so you can't actually have a machine parse it. It'll have all of these uh, funky quirks to it. It'll prompts will pop up. Uh, it, it, it'll change from release to, to, to release, and it'll have all these sort of quirks to it that makes it different in different flavors of, of your operating system. It, it's really hard for a machine to parse it. It's good for a human. But the other big thing in the CLI is that it, most of our uh, network elements have all these implicit and underlying dependencies. You apparently have to configure your interface before you can do your VLAN. Oh, no, it's the other way around. It's, it's how to build a complex function. It usually takes all these uh, long documents, and you have to do them in, in the right order. If you try to do it manually, you might get a help for er error message. But it's hopeless for a machine to understand all of these ordering and dependencies. And so what, I think what, how NetConf solves this is by having a transaction, being able to talk about a change that is all of this or nothing of it, so that you don't have to worry about ordering, and you can just focus on the change that you want to do. REST by itself, it's, it's not a standard. It's, um, it's a concept. And I would say it's, 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 it's pretty good as a concept, but it does not solve that dependency issue. It basically solves the syntactic issue of having, being able to parse your, uh, your information, but you're still stuck with having to do operations towards these elements in a particular order and, and to, to perform the function that you want to do. And I just, I, since, since I also have engineer in my title, I just had to throw in some, some uh, funky looking code. And, what I wanted to show with this was just what I said before, is that I find it, I mean, both readable as a person, and once you actually see it, it's not only a specification, it is the API itself. It's concrete. It's not sort of some abstract idea of what's going on in there, uh, going on in, in, in the element. All right. This is not, I mean, this is technology that's out there, and uh, a lot of us are using it. Uh, Cisco itself is shipping uh, its new XC version 16 with uh, NetConf enable. Uh, just you can just go ahead and enable it. I know uh, Juniper has been started publishing their Yang models since since a couple of years back. They of course have had NetConf for a long time. Um, it's happening uh, all over the place. So it's it's a really mature standard. It's really time that we also demand that our that that our VNFs uh, have an API that we can talk to not just that humans can, can sort of script against. So what if everybody just starts uh, uh, publishing their own Yang models? Well, I'd say we're at least in that better place where uh, our, our functions actually have uh, APIs uh, and that it's actually consumable for something at the other end. There are uh, actually 
uh, now work going on uh, much more recent than the standards themselves to actually have standardized models so that everybody would have the same interface model, the same BGP model, the same model for everything like that. Both IETF uh, as well as OpenConfig is working on this. Uh, I see that as, as something good that we strive for that, but until we can ag agree uh, on something that, that everybody can implement, I think just the fact that you implement uh, NetConf and Yang on your uh, on your device will get us a long way. All right, so of course I have to mention uh, one way of getting NetConf on your device, and it's, it's using Confti. Uh, there, uh, we built Confti at TLF, so, and we've been involved in, in IETF as well uh, to implement the, the standard. Um, nowadays, of course, we also have not just Net NetConf, I mean, we have RESTConf, Advantages of, of using something like Confti is, is uh, really provide a quick way to integrate with whatever your VNF is doing and to just write your Yang models and get all the protocols for, uh, for, uh, by, by just using that specification. That's, you can read more about that. You can read more about NetConf and Yang. And uh, you can also come down and talk to the guys here that are representing Confti. Thank you, Sebastian. All right, thank I you. I think we have time for one question. Any, any questions? So, so the, uh, the question is like, am I just making up that NetConf will solve the dependency issue? Well, uh, I, I am in the sense that it's perfectly doable to, to, uh, to, uh, to make a device that, that follows Yang and NetConf, but that forgets to, to, uh, to actually uh, to implement, to solve this problem. I mean, I would argue if you read the, 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 the standard carefully, it's sort of implied in there, but it's not really spelt out. So I would say that the concept of a transaction and the, uh, the concept of having a, a, a new version of your configuration as either completely valid or not, that's, what's, that's what kind of pushes the, the ordering problem to the implementer of the device. So, it, it, it is, but it, it's, uh, I think, a prerequisite for to be able to implement it and, and sort of solving that is that you actually have the concept of a transaction. And that concept isn't there uh, with, without this type of standard. So it's like for, if you just have a plain REST API, it's still sort of poke, 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 maybe sort of multiple pokes, but it's, you're, you're still kind of having that. But you have to have the concept of, of yet you're actually not just modifying uh, uh, these individual elements, you're doing that uh, as a construction of a transaction. I think that really is what kind of forces the, uh, the network element implementer to think about that and solve the, uh, the ordering problem in its code rather than sort of in the orchestration piece of it. Okay, thank you, Sebastian. Thank you.